Broadcasting to the Wizarding World since 2008. HP ANA's official Harry Potter podcast. Official Harry Potter podcast. This. 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 This is Hogwarts Radio. This is Hogwarts Radio, episode 224 for December 2nd, 2018. Hogwarts Radio is HPANA.com's podcast discussing all things Harry Potter, Fantastic Beasts, and the rest of the Wizarding World. For the quickest up-to-date news on the franchise, make sure you check out HPANA.com. Hello everyone, and this is Hogwarts Radio, broadcasting to Harry Potter fans worldwide since 2008. I'm Terrence Pinkston. And I'm Gretchen Rush. Our show can be found virtually anywhere online, such as iTunes, the Google Podcast app, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Radio Public, and other places where podcasts are aggregated. It doesn't matter where or how you listen, just make sure to tap the subscribe button and we guarantee you'll have a new episode each Sunday. We also invite you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram so you never miss an update from the show. Don't forget, Hogwarts Radio is also on Patreon. By pledging, you'll have instant access to many benefits, including exclusive merchandise, host vlogs, behind-the-scenes planning of the show, Hogshead Radio, and much more. Visit patreon.com slash Hogwarts Radio to sign up today. Welcome to episode 224. What a what a wonderful panel we have today. So much brilliance and beauty all in one place. I really can't wait for the day that we do this all in studio together instead of over a Google Hangout. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. I agree. Well, making her second appearance in a row, might I add, the wonderful Sydney Mook. Hi, Sydney. Hi, how are you guys? Well, <laughs> we're still reeling from the crimes of Grindelwald, as I'm sure most of the fandom <laughs> is right now. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll get over it. I think we just have to kind of work through. What are the what is it like the five stages of grievance or something like that? Like we're <laughs> we're in denial right now. No, it wasn't. It wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad movie. Bad. I believe it's so grief, far. not grievance. Yeah. Oh. I think those are two different things. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It might be a grievance. I might have a grievance with the film. It's it's true. <laughs> well, Sydney, thank you so much for joining us today. And as real quick, where can people find you online? Um, so you guys can follow me online. Um, I have Instagram. It'll be at Sydney Moo. So basically, my name without the K. And then you can follow me over on Twitter um, at Sydney underscore Mook M O O K. You get a lot of uh, North Dakota news, a lot of uh, Yankees ramblings, and a lot of uh, Harry Potter stuff. So it's a good, it's a good conglomerate of uh, of content over there. So are you a Yankees fan, or you just like I to am. rant them? Oh, okay, okay. Oh no, <laughs> very much a Yankees fan. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Well, we would also like to thank Radio Public for reaching out to us earlier this week and featuring us on the Indie Podcasts to Watch category. And you can download Radio Public on the app stores for iOS and Android. And your subscription to our show over there helps us keep our featured position, and we'd really appreciate a rating as well. So maybe we do have a grievance with Crimes of Grindelwald, or maybe most people do. Uh, I, I, so, okay, a few days ago, Sydney and I were having an interesting conversation on our Patreon channel of our Slack chat, and we dug kind of deep into the possible response of this film so far just because of the box office numbers. Now, I joked, playfully joked, that we needed another episode only for the box office numbers, but that's actually turning into a reality right now. Uh, so let's take a look at what's been going on at the box office. So currently the film stands at $442.5 million worldwide. Domestically in the United States, it's made $120.3 million. It, l- let's just get this straight right now, guys. These aren't bad numbers. The movie came out on the 16th of November. Um, and this is including the pre-screenings, which was like around $9 million or so. Like I said, these aren't bad numbers. It's bad for the Wizarding World franchise. Sure, this movie ranks 10th right now in all the movies, and it may crawl to a $700 million total, but not much higher. That is troubling for this franchise, though. Since Black Friday, though, theaters aren't seeing any growth 
with the fans of this movie. It continues to post 50 to 60 point drops in overall revenue and overall attendance as well, uh, which is interesting because it's still at a wide release of 4,000. 163 theaters yeah i think it's um i i don't know where it's entirely suffering at um you know we brought up the fact that they did all those early fan screenings um i wonder if that had you know at least a little bit of an impact on where it's still sitting and then people also just don't seem to like the movie so that's an issue Mm -hmm. um it's just a it's, it's it's not playing well. It's also seemed to get that uh, the sequel issue of, of people don't like the sequels of mm-hmm. movies. So it's, it's got a lot of bad things going for it, it seems. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's just me who's not seeing anything anymore, but I feel almost like they stopped pushing it. They're pushing it so hard up until the release. And then it came out and they were like, all right, world, it's yours. But I don't think that's how you should do a movie. Maybe no. it's just me. Right. No, I, I mean, I, I, I can see that. I mean, they don't obviously they're not, they're not pushing it as hard, but I still get the tweets every now and then, like a couple of times a day from the Fantastic Beasts film account where they just tweet out the, uh, as we mentioned last episode, the, the reviews from influencers, from people online, from Twitter accounts and stuff like that. Not really really big name critics which is interesting to say the least a lot of people what what i initially thought was that they were boycotting johnny depp right and they were trying to make a statement to warner brothers the opening weekend so i kind of expected the the, the numbers to jump a little bit um in, in which they did i mean it wasn't it wasn't a lot but it wasn't what i expected and then now this week now that everybody's back to school and work after the thanksgiving holiday it's just really bombed i mean i think it's and i say bombed as in it's gone from number one to number four but it's really hard for a number four movie to go back to number one and i don't think that's going to happen to this this particular film yeah i i don't um foresee their numbers really getting um too much better unfortunately you know i thought it was interesting so when i so even though i live in in north dakota which is a a rural area um you know i live in one of the biggest cities in north dakota and that's like sixty thousand people um but the opening night we went or i guess not opening night but friday night which is a popular movie night um that's when my mom and i went to go see it the first time and the theater wasn't full and i thought that was weird um and then we went again to a different theater um a couple of nights later like the night before thanksgiving which i I feel like is also a popular night to go see movies and it was literally us one other family and i think maybe one other couple so maybe in total there was maybe a dozen of us in the theater and it made me really sad because i figured there was at least people that would have you know some sort of interest in seeing the film um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. That's true. Uh, Gretchen, what about you? How w- We didn't hear from you last week on how full your theater was whenever you initially saw it. It was not full. We went 7 p.m. on Thursday. So it was the first time that you could have seen it at this theater. Um, and I live in a pretty well-populated area. I'm in Saratoga Springs, um, which, you know, it's outside Albany. There's a lot of surrounding towns here. And normally, like, when I see star wars here the theater is packed like the new star wars movie so we expected it to be pretty full and it was probably 30 people max i want to say wow maybe less and how big was the auditorium like you know because most of these theaters have okay so not most but some of the big ones have about 300 seats in them Um, i know i think ours was not that big i want to say it was 200 max Okay. My theater, it was one of those... Okay, so to be fair, it was one of the nicer theaters. It was the kind with the reclining seats and the people, they would bring you food and like massage your feet. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, it was really nice. They bring you food and, you know, uh, refill your drink and... and it wasn't it wasn't as pricey as kind of the one of the normal theaters I go to. But my point with it is it was about 100 seats and it wasn't even full. Like we had friends that were able to get tickets the same day and and get pretty decent seats so uh, that was my first indication like oh my god this movie is not gonna do as well yeah um i don't know i wasn't i don't really know what i was expecting for like looking at my theater because all of our theaters yeah they're about less than a hundred people yeah probably about a hundred people i would say um and i that was like the first time that I'd seen like a major blockbuster 
franchisey kind of film um, here. And so I wasn't know I didn't know what I was expecting, but I was not expecting it to be probably a fourth empty at least, if not half empty. Um, and then I wasn't expecting a couple of days later for basically the entire theater to be entirely empty. I'm just remembering now, um, I mentioned Star Wars before, but actually before that was The Hobbit, which you wouldn't think The Hobbit would have had a large premiere, but people were lined up for that. And not just for the first one, like we had all three movies, people were lined up at our theater on opening night to see it. And no one, I think, will claim that those were the greatest movies of all time. They're, they had a lot of issues, mm -hmm. um, but people were still there and willing to see them. And just comparing that experience to this experience, it didn't even feel like I was seeing a new Wizarding World movie. It just felt like on opening night, it felt like I was just going to see a movie any day. And actually, it was less packed than movies that I go to see on any other day. That's that's very troubling. Because um, like you said, you compared the franchises like um, The Hobbit and Star Wars. In fact, Gretchen, did you go see Star Wars uh, The Last Jedi? Was, was your theater full? And that was, was the second... Full. That was the second film in this kind of, exactly. you know, th that series. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's not it's not a sequel syndrome, I guess we could say. It's it's there's something wrong with the community, with people not being interested, with people being pissed off or it's it's really hard to nail down. Like, I mean, for the most part, like well, the way I feel where they should have started with this movie, with the marketing was with the true Potter influences. We talked about this last week, but the websites, you know, the podcast, the people that have been with them for, you know, 10 plus years, ever since Pottermore became this kind of news and editorial site, I feel that Warner Brothers has distanced themselves from the fans, but what they didn't count on was, you know, these sites, podcasts, and influencers having these massive loyal followings that didn't make the transition to Pottermore. You know, they look at Pottermore like, it was okay, like a, a reference material, like a resource, uh, an official resource that they can use. And I feel like Warner Brothers has really left those fans high and dry. And then now it's too late for Warner Brothers to backtrack and course correct with the true fans that they left behind. Um, and after this movie, many Harry Potter fans have made up their minds about, you know, they're not going to see the rest of these Fantastic Beast movies. They just, it's not their cup of tea. They didn't like them. You know, they're discovering that they are just, in fact, Harry Potter fans. Not J.K. Rowling fans, not Wizarding World fans, Harry Potter fans. And the scary part about all of this is that if these movies continue to underperform, Warner Brothers, who retains all all rights to the Wizarding World, can effectively cancel the remainder of the movies. There's, there's not a damn thing that we can do about it. And, and any other studio, you know, it can't be picked up by Netflix because Warner Brothers owns the rights, and they will never, ever get rid of the rights of this franchise. Yeah, I wonder if it is a little bit of, like, a, a Potter fatigue. If people... Because there were so much, so many issues that went into this, you know, from kind of the beginning, from, you know, the everybody putting their foot in the mouth um, about the whole entire Dumbledore Grindelwald thing, um, Johnny Depp's higher uh, casting, um, you know, and just kind of everything that along, went along with that. I wonder if kind of the, the general public also is just burnt out by the idea of Harry Potter and anything to do with that, which... Mm -hmm to me doesn't make a ton of sense because it had been two years since the last Fantastic Beast movie and you know another what like seven years since the previous Potter movie um I I don't know maybe it's just a story that the general public feels like they can't relate with and then there's Potter fans that don't really like Fantastic Beasts because I've seen that I've seen that comment in a lot of different fan groups Mm -hmm. that I'm in they're like eh, I didn't just really like Fantastic Beasts um so I'm not gonna go see this one that's perfectly fine but I think it's just all of that collecting together is adding to the the box office issue yeah yeah definitely and my friends went to see it a week after the movie's release and they're not like hardcore fans but they've seen all the other ones and I I asked one of my friends I was like oh what'd you think and he goes it's good and I was like yeah <laughs> he goes yeah you know, perfectly fine second movie, setting up stuff for the third one. I was like, yeah, you're right. I feel like the consensus of people who've seen it is kind of like, if you're not talking about one of these huge reveals, 
it was fine. And as divisive as The Last Jedi was, people were talking about that movie for a very long time. There was a lot to discuss about that. And a lot of things happened that made that movie very interesting. And I feel like, barring a few twists, Crimes of Grindelwald didn't offer as much for people to discuss. Yeah, I mean, a few twists. <laughs> I mean, really, the main discussion about this movie was centered around the whole controversies that surrounded it and and let's face it this this movie out of the entire wizarding world franchise had the most controversy around it um other than i mean the only thing that i can really think of is movie six whenever that got pushed back a few months more than a few months i mean everybody was pissed i remember the internet blowing up uh, about it and and i remember us spending at least a couple of episodes talking about why they did it early on early in our podcast. So I think there's, you know, we could talk forever about the box office numbers and why they are the way they are. Um, you know, I, I honestly, to wrap it up, I don't feel like this, this franchise is in jeopardy. Um, they've had 10 films so far. This is the lowest performing movie of the franchise. They've had nine other successful films. Um, I, you know, do I think J.K. Rowling is not going to have as free of reign as she had? Sure, maybe somebody will be offered by Warner Brothers to help her. I, you know, I, I, I feel like maybe she might be in over her head. I don't know, uh, I, and I won't know until I see the rest of these movies and be able to make that judgment. But of course, by then it's it's too late, right, to say, oh, she could have used the help on this movie to this movie. But we all know J.K. Rowling is a mastermind at writing. It doesn't matter what she's writing. It could be a children's book. It could be a short essay it could be a tweet it doesn't matter she's a mastermind at what she does she does everything for a reason in her writing and the fans i think the fantastic beast fans need to trust what she's doing is going to be the right thing for this franchise and i completely trust what she is going to do so we asked the question um uh, we asked a couple of questions on facebook throughout the week though uh but w- we wanted to answer your questions and specifically questions that you guys had about the franchise and about the movie and things like that. So Sydney threw that post up on Facebook and now we're going to answer some of those. So Sydney, what do you have? Yeah. So we've got some fun ones and then we've got some more serious ones. So um, first of all, we have uh, Fiona Moore who says she has more of a fan th- or she has more of a theory than a question. I think there's more. I think there's more to Queenie going on with uh, Grindelwald. I think somehow she's with him because Dumbledore wants her to be. Uh, we found out in Crimes of Grindelwald that Newt was in New York on Dumbledore's orders. There's definitely more to this. Only 722 days until we find out. <laughs> oh, what a tease! <laughs> oh my gosh! Spoiler That's alert. An interesting theory, though. Yeah, but I like that theory. Yeah, I think I like that, that would, would make sense. Uh, yeah, no. I'd be interested to know, you know, how well uh, Dumbledore knows, like, Queenie and Tina. Never thought about that, actually. I, I think that Grindelwald knows... Okay, so Grindelwald's the master manipulator, right? He's the master BSer um, in this series. I mean, well, arguably. I mean, I think Dumbledore is, too, but... <laughs> But Dumbledore, I mean, Grindelwald is the the master BSer in the negative light, right? Um, So I think that he saw how weak Queenie is um, and saw how he could quickly manipulate her based off of, you know, playing off her emotions and what she, um, you know, what she ultimately wants. And what she ultimately wants is her and Jacob to be together, right? And to be acknowledged and for it to be all right, for nobody to get in trouble and nobody to get hurt. Um, but uh, I don't know if, so I, I mean, I like, I like the theory, but I, I don't think she's with him because Dumbledore wants her to be. I, th- I think, I, I don't think Dumbledore and Queenie have ever spoken. I mean, Quinny's from America. Dumbledore's from the UK. Um, I, I just don't see it. I, I I don't at all. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. I feel like we posited pretty well on why Queenie is with Grindelwald, and I think it does make sense the choice she made. Um, so I don't think that Dumbledore is involved. Yeah, I tend to agree, but that's a fun theory. I'd never thought about kind of like like I said, their relationship with. Teeny and Queen's relationship with Dumbledore and you know how much they know about him so it's it's kind of fun to think about mm-hmm. yeah 
Uh, next, we have uh, Jamie Eliza. Um, and they ask, um, how slash why did Credence get involved with the circus anyway? He's hyper-focused on finding his birth mother, and then he just hits the pause button um, to perform in the circus. Is there a, uh, was it a way for him to travel internationally? I, I think, yes. I think it was like the, <laughs> I think it was, okay. So I think Credence was kind of like out there searching and then he got into trouble and then like the, the circus master or the, what do they call it? The ringmaster was like, oh, come here. Life of like, kind of like the Pinocchio effect. Right. And he locked him in a cage and he was like, oh, you know, all these riches and all these, you know, I got the answers and yada, yada, and you'll be able to travel. And I think that's what Credence ultimately wanted was to kind of break out of the area that he was in and just go and travel and find, you know, find answers. Because obviously the answers weren't waiting for him uh, there in New York. But uh, he did want you know, he's on a search. He's on a search for identity. And we'll talk about we'll talk about that in a bit. But you know, I think it was just happenstance that he got involved with this traveling circus. They might have seen the kind of magic that he could perform. Well, well I was wondering the same thing because it. Uh, I don't. They don't explain it, and I don't get it at all because it is a magic circus, which means that he really couldn't have sought it out. So they must have approached him. But ultimately, it worked to his advantage because it brought him to the place where he wanted to be to try to find his mother. So it's all very coincidental to me. Yeah. Well. I'm trying to remember if I can't remember. Maybe I'm remembering this wrong. But in the first Fantastic Beast movie, doesn't he like look at a poster of the? Um, That's the second circuit? one. Oh, it's uh, second and I don't one. know if it even made it into the movie, but that was a promo image for the second one. Okay. Yep. That's exactly what I'm. Thinking. I don't think it was yeah. in the final cut. Then we have no idea why. He's there. <laughs> right. <laughs> At least not that we are remembering as a collective. So. Yeah, we need those deleted scenes, I think. Yeah, that's desperately so many. That's going to be key. There's a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the film that we actually saw in the trailer. Uh, the ball scene with Lita, that was one of them. Um, what was another one of them? The. I forgot. <laughs> that was the big one that stuck that was, out to me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, dang, there was another one that was really big and I didn't. I didn't remember. I didn't write it down. That's okay. But yeah, there's, I mean, I can't wait for the deleted scenes because that's going to, I feel like that's going to give us more context uh, behind why certain characters are doing certain things. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. It, it's a, it's a big question mark why he's there. Um, you know, it, it, yeah. I mean, Jamie makes a good point. It's a way for him to travel internationally. I, I think so, but um that's kind of like the big the the big answer right now it's just a way for him to travel um jamie had also had another question um dealing with the the creature that was um in the carriage with uh grindelwald and uh the ministry official Mm -hmm. um so he talks about um you know when the film opens we see a creature that is imprisoned with grindelwald it's shackled to him in prison and then it's extradited to the minist- uh, British ministry with him. And then, you know, Grindelwald takes over the carriage, all that fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but the creature shows of uh, Grindelwald affection, but then Grindelwald just, you know, threw it to the ocean. And- right. Tosses it out the window. <laughs> He's like, I'm done with you. actually <laughs> kind of funny. It was funny. I laughed. Um, yeah. But so uh, Jamie asks, you know, what what's its connection to Grindelwald? You know, why was it locked up in there with him? Isn't that the Chupacabra, right? Oh, you're right. Yeah. It was the Chupacabra. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you the reason why that beast was there. I know for a fact. Why? Here's, here's my definitive answer. Because the movie's called Fantastic Beasts. <laughs> that's I'm exactly why, right? that that's the reason that creature was there. 100% sure? 100% sure. Okay, okay. I will ask JK Rowling and she will confirm. <laughs> <laughs> that beast had no purpose at all. Gotcha. Yeah, I was very confused. No, it, it, why it, he got a pet in jail? Like, right. jail <laughs> like can Chupacabra why? swim? Like, can he swim? Like, because they were over water, and I hope that little guy's okay. He's okay. Okay, I have faith that he's okay. <laughs> it's just gonna show up like two movies down, and yes, he's gonna have like a really big vital role. He's gonna be like giant though. This is like, yeah, he's he's gonna be the one to defeat Grindelwald. He's like, this is for throwing me out the window. <laughs> That's the secret that no one knew. Dumbledore didn't defeat him. 
It was the chupacabra. It was the chupacabra. <laughs> the chupacabra did it. <laughs> so we, we got a couple more. These ones are, are a little bit more fun. Mm-hmm. Um, Elizabeth Sartor asks, um, what happened to their wizard robes? They're all beautifully dressed, but in muggle clothes. I got to say, though, I prefer the suits. Mm-hmm. I prefer uh, Dumbledore, 100%. a nice three-piece suit. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. My favorite meme is the one that's like, when did Dumbledore decide gray three-piece suits were out and bejeweled robes and hats were in? <laughs> well, if you remember, like, from the Harry Potter series, from the very first book, it was like a, uh, like, the description of the robe was, like, multicolored and stuff like that. It looked mm-hmm. funny and all that other stuff. But, I mean, I have to say that Dumbledore, Dumbledore's got style. Dumbledore looks like Dumble Yummy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my other favorite meme along those lines is the one of him um like young young door and then we got like uh dumbledore from chamber of secrets and like he's got a beard and looks just like really like sad and like stressed <laughs> and we're, like what happened in this like i think it's like 20 years or not even 20 years like 16 years or something like that right <laughs> right <laughs> exactly what went wrong here <laughs> And then we have my favorite question uh, from Julie Bruni. Uh, she asks, will JK... <laughs> then we have my favorite question from Julie Bruni. She asks, will JK Rowling answer the simple question, what year was Professor McGonagall really born? So this is the big debate, right? This is like, this I is have. going all around the internet right now. I've seen it on Reddit. Um, and I think mm-hmm. the best explanation comes from our friend Lucas Lask over at Hypable. Well, he wrote an yes. article over at Hypable. <laughs> an awesome article. I love it to death. It was and so good. I've never seen Lucas write, like ever. But this article was like, like on fleek, like it was on point guys. Um, so please go check it out. It's one of the top articles over there right now. And I'm sure it will be for the next couple of days, but he argues that McGonagall might've been born in like what, 1889 or something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So which would explain, you know, why she was there. So yeah, I mean, I agree. J.K. Rowling, just answer the damn question. What year was Professor McGonagall really born, please? I know you say on Pottermore that, you know, she was, you know, in certain places at certain times. But come on, like, why the name drop? Please just like give us give us context to the canon, please. Like we're we're, we're desperate for it. I'm asking, please, please, J.K. Rowling, please. <laughs> I will take any explanation at this point. <laughs> she is the time turner. That's the only explanation that we can like fathom at this point is that McGonagall somehow used a time turner or she was born in 1889, which will mm-hmm. put her which will put her at like a hundred and what ten at the end of the series, 109. Yeah. I mean, she did take several spells to the chest and did survive. So yeah. Tough old bird. Tough old bird. <laughs> well, that uh, that wraps up the uh, comment section, and we encourage you to please go and uh, find the thread that we have on our Facebook. It says we will be recording episode two twenty five later. T- uh, I'm sorry, two twenty four later today. What cu- what questions about crimes of Grindelwald do you have? Let us answer them. Comment in the post, and we'll be happy to read them on the podcast. So I started this thread on Reddit about the themes of Crimes of Grindelwald. And it got pretty deep in some cases with some particular characters. And I, I figured, well, we need to start a, a discussion about this on the podcast, right? We need to start exploring these characters. So the discussion we're going to have today is exploration and figurative character search. We're going to go through a couple of characters and, and their search... They're figurative searches, not literal, because those are all out in the open. Um, we, we all know what they're doing, you know, obviously. But let, let's talk about the figurative search searches. So Newt, for example, Newt doesn't realize it, but he thinks he's already decided where he stands and what actions he will or won't take. You know, at the beginning of the movie, he's like, uh, I don't take sides. But by the end of the movie, we know that's all changed. So for a lot of the movie, I feel like Newt is searching for a way to handle how he feels about his emotions about Tina and Lita. 
You know, he's obviously torn between the two. He needs advice on how to approach Tina and let her know how he feels that that comedic scene with him and and Jacob. Um, He's like, so what do I say to her whenever I see her? (laughs) You know, Jacob's giving him all this advice and stuff. Very funny stuff. And then at the same time, he's still working through his feelings for Lita. And to be honest, I really don't think he gets over Lita. I'm curious why you think that, because I didn't see much at all of him being interested in her. He didn't really treat her, in my opinion differently than he treated a lot of other people so i just didn't see it It, it's the subtleties you know it's it's that um he doesn't kind of brush her off in fantastic beasts in the first movie he still uh, has her picture in the suitcase and that's that's interesting you know either he thinks of her as a very dear friend or as something that could have been that he feels maybe he made a mistake on the way that he talks to lita the way that he kind of approaches her i i just really don't feel that he he's over her like completely i kind of forgot that he had the the photo in the uh in the case Um, from the first movie so I guess that kind of changes my mind a little bit on their relationship but I always viewed their relationship as more of like a a a close friendship like somebody like they they each needed somebody to lean on um and then you know the the whole thing with like Decius really kind of maybe messed things up in that sense but I never really viewed their relationship totally as like, you know, he, he missed out on the girl or he was in love with Lita. You know, maybe maybe at some point in time he was. Um, but now he's trying to like figure out how he feels about Lita given that his really or um her relationship with his brother. Um but yeah, I'm not really sure how I feel about them. Well, you never know what you want until or you never know what you have until it's gone, right? And Don't to him, know what you got till it's gone, right? <laughs> That's the way I feel. Like he sees his brother have her, and you know he he loves his brother more than anything. He wouldn't dare kind of ever go against or challenge for a female or anything like that. I, I at least I don't think you know take the girl like attempt to take the girl from him. I don't think that Newt is is like that. Um I think that Newt just kind of buries his head in his work to deal with his emotions. Yeah, I can understand that. So I you know throughout the movie I do feel like like he's on a figurative search like how he feels maybe for both of them. Um, and, and also balancing his beasts, right? He loves his beasts. He loves his job. He loves what he does. Um, and I don't think it, that Newt is the kind of person to give that up for anything. And I feel like somebody that understands that is going to understand him and will be with him for the long run. Uh, so let's talk about Queenie. So by the end of the movie, Queenie is set up to really have to think and search within herself to figure out who she is and what she wants and what she's doing in the rest of the movies. So we all know what Queenie wants, right? She wants a life with Jacob. She wants a life that isn't going to be chastised or looked down upon. She wants to be able to marry this nomad, which is frowned upon in America apparently for some reason she is willing to go to extreme lengths to be able to accomplish that um yeah and i think it's also you know she's got a she had a lot of issues um going on during that entire movie and like there's everything with jacob um and she wants to be with jacob um but there's also all these issues that she had with tina and that you know tina didn't really approve of her and jacob being together and clearly that set the two up heart to the point that like when Queenie went into the the fire to go join Grindelwald he didn't really do anything Mm -hmm. I felt like she like called out but didn't really do anything other than that right um so you know I feel like it's also you know soul searching on trying to figure out her family and kind of just like what she wants in life in general Mm -hmm. because right now I think she feels kind of alone so she's just trying to search for her place in the world yeah no, that, that's a very good point. She um, she has a lot of a lot of stuff happening to her this movie. You know, the fact that she's illegitimate is is trying on her because she can hear everything, and we see that 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 it literally drives her crazy. I I don't think that she's necessarily learn how to control that properly um, and block out all of those feelings. Or let's say maybe emotion can play on that and overrides any kind of control that you might have. And you still feel like you're, you know, you're drowning in voices 
at that point. I just, um, you know, I think Queenie knows what she wants. She, what's ultimately going to happen to her, she's going to see what Grindelwald really is and that he is willing to do anything to get this uh, message out there that wizards are better than nomages or muggles and he's willing to kill anybody to that gets in his path i think queenie's gonna see that and just ultimately say you know what nope this is not for me um and and try to go back but she'll be stuck she'll be stuck with grindelwald for the next i foresee like three movies at least and then at the end we're gonna see you know what it doesn't matter what uh what grindelwald has done it's it's good it, what only matters is her love for jacob and then that's whenever they're gonna get together for the long haul yeah i'd be down with queenie staying with grindelwald for a bit and maybe if she does realize like oh i made a mistake turning double agent and trying to work um from the inside i think that would be a pretty cool twist i think that'd be neat yeah, but uh, let me ask you, Gretchen. Do you think she's strong enough to uh, work as a double agent for Dumbledore? She seems... We haven't met a lot of, like, really skilled legilimens like her. So I think she's very strong, and I think she knows what she wants, and she's willing to do... We've seen she's willing to do pretty much anything to get what she wants. So I think it would be awesome to have her be like, you know what? I'm going to start taking this down from the inside. Tell me what to do. And then just like taking everybody out. I think that would be really cool. And she could manipulate people with her legilimens and with her charm and with her smile. I just, I love Queenie and I would love to see her do something like really awesome. I would really love for Queenie to have a, a solid redemption arc like that. That would be wonderful because right now I'm really disappointed in the character. Um, you know, I love Queenie. I really did. I thought she was so innocent, so meek. So, you know, here's my sister. We're, you know, we're following each other, all that good stuff. But I would love for her character to to expand like that and have that that really, really nice redemption art. Um, I don't want Queenie to be, you know, one of those characters that is full of regrets. I think that the way for her to work through the regrets that she is ultimately going to have is by taking Grindelwald's regime down from the inside. So that's a great point, Gretchen. Uh, Lita. Lita doesn't start out on a search, but after rumors that Credence is her dead brother start up and she talks to Dumbledore, she's got to figure out if she's just really um, born natural bad or if she can confess to what happened to her brother, etc. Things like that. What kind of a search do you think Lita is on for this movie? Lita is such an interesting character to try and figure out for me. Having seen the movie a, a couple of times, tried to zero in on her like over the second time that I saw it. And I think that she was just so guilt ridden still about the, the whole switch with the baby that maybe she was just trying to find a way to be able to speak the truth and to say it out loud. Because clearly for you know, years and years and years at this point. Um, so maybe she was just searching for a way to get that out and to have some resolution to that. I'm not not entirely sure what she was necessarily searching for, you know? Yeah, she was hard for me to get a grasp on. I don't know if it's because she didn't have enough scenes for me to really understand her, um, but she felt almost passive to me she wasn't really doing anything she was following theses around she's like oh yeah i'm in this department now i guess whatever and i'm like what do you even like what do you want to do i'll never know because now you're dead and she doesn't make a lot of choices ultimately she decides to tell them the story or she doesn't even tell the story the other guy tells the story about the baby <laughs> and then she's like okay now i'll tell my story about the baby since you've already talked about the kid so i felt like she didn't the only choice she made was the very end when she fought grindelwald and got herself killed so i didn't see a lot from her to make me understand what she wanted what she was searching for and i think sydney's right i think it's a lot of guilt driving that and that i can totally understand but i i did want more from that character 
yeah, I think a lot of us felt that way that that her arc progressed so fast and so furious that she was a one character movie. But I, I honestly, I don't know if she's completely dead or not. You know, there's a lot of things that have to happen sure. in the in the timeline for like people like Bellatrix Lestrange to uh, appear. So L- Lita. If she is, in fact, dead, that's going to throw a kink into all of that. But uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to say that she's entirely dead. And, and in fact, I think she's still on the same kind of search, you know, that she's, you know, she doesn't know what she wants. She doesn't know who she loves. Uh, well, OK, so let me take that back. She knows who she loves, but she is just settling at this point, you know, with uh Theseus so it's like oh I've got a good thing going here you know this isn't a bad setup let me you know yeah let's go ahead and marry him you know I kind of like him he's kind of cute uh but you know at the end of the day she still loves Newt so she's still on a search for like an internal search like Lita was one of those characters that we didn't know too much about uh, throughout the movie and then bam at the end we're hit with all this information and then we're hit with her figurative death at the very end Um, and then like we have to sit here and process oh wow what kind of a person was she and you know why what is the behind the decisions that she made you know we still don't know what the big thing was that happened between her and Newt they didn't show that at least I didn't catch in the movie that that separated those two for good no yeah they didn't show that um quick sidebar bellatrix lestrange is a lestrange by marriage so that means that her husband would be the lestrange who would need to be born Mm -hmm. so whoever is back in the line is most likely not Lita lestrange because theoretically Lita lestrange would have taken her husband's name and then not been a lestrange anymore which means that there needs to be a male lestrange to carry on that lestrange name and lestrange rant (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I didn't think about that before. I always assumed that Bellatrix was a Lestrange, you know, because she was so in tune with the the whole family line, you know, the, the Lestrange yeah. vault that was at the depths of Gringotts that was very, very old. And, you know, I was I didn't think about that. Jesus. OK, well, <laughs> the more, you know, <laughs> Let's talk about Dumbledore for a moment. Dumbledore is on more of a secret soul search as he revisits his feelings for Grindelwald. So what happened to his sister and all of his regrets about it and how he feels about not being able to fight Grindelwald. So we can see that the Dumbledore character is very conflicted at this point. Um, and that's why he has to get Newt to, you know, take care of Grindelwald, uh, to fight Grindelwald. But, uh, I mean, at the same time, we understand why that is the way it is because of the blood pact, but we don't know the magic behind the blood pact. That's still a big question mark. But we can see Dumbledore, like, with scenes such as the Mirror of Erised and all that other stuff, having this internal conflict about Grindelwald. You know, he doesn't want to have to deal with it. Yeah, I think Dumbledore's really trying to figure out what his um his actions you know regarding everything that happened with um with his sister um and how all that played out um and then you know maybe like he when he looks at that vial when he gets the blood packed he hands it to him he, he just looks so sad and kind of conflicted and he is like oh um mm, okay yeah uh, how are we gonna figure this out yeah. And so like I think he's also just trying to figure out, you know, how how does he move forward? Right. But it's clear also, you know, that he still cares about Grindelwald. So he's trying to he's trying to figure out all of his emotions and keep them in check with reality. Yeah, really. I mean, it's this struggle, right, that Dumbledore's having right now. And Newt's like, Oh, can you destroy it? And I'm sure Dumbledore knows the answer to it. Oh yeah, I of course I could destroy it. It's if I can destroy it. You know, there's that the other kind of if it's like, oh, we made this, you know, there's this blood pact, this promise to each other that we wouldn't break. And his feelings are conflicting him right now. Um, And he does he does a very good job at masking them right to his his students or the people that admire him and and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I, I just feel that Dumbledore, while he may project an outward strong very capable wizard internally he's having this struggle and he's very very weak gretchers any thoughts no i think you guys summed it up pretty well 
Okay. So let's talk about Grindelwald. I know we blew past Dumbledore, but really, I mean, I think we kind of hit that on the head to where we don't have to talk about it right now. Grindelwald literally at this point is just on a search for followers, but deep dive into it, and, and it could be he's searching for truth. And I know it kind of sounds backwards, but it's an it's really an admirable thing. And guys, please don't kill me for this comment, but he's tired of his people being oppressed and having to hide. And really where this all falls apart is his way of thinking that wizards and witches are superior to muggles. You know, like one, like they can't coexist together unless like the wizards and witches are controlling the muggles. And unless it's made clear that wizards and witches are superior to muggles. At this point, I'm just searching for more of Grindelwald's backstory. Because <laughs> I need to know more about how he became the person that he is. Right. And got all these I like ideal ideologies and I just need to know more about Grindelwald, like <laughs> desperately. Yeah, I think we got a pretty a good hint in this film and I'm okay with that I'm excited to learn more in the future films and kind of see exactly where he's trying to take this like once he's got the followers what's step two that's what I'm curious about right right do you come out of hiding do you bring your entire community out of hiding you know what do you do what's the what's the we already know the end game right that wizards are wizards and witches are going to rule over the muggles but how do you get there um and what steps do you take to make that happen that's that's really the thing uh, maybe you know maybe it's he started world war 2 um you know maybe it's he started these conflicts within these countries and put one person up against another. Like we all know that to destroy an entity, it's from, it's not from placing another entity like against it. It's to destroy it within. Ooh, that's pretty good because that falls right in line with credence. Like, okay. Credence is searching for identity. We know. And we know that like we like who he is, how he fits in, where he belongs. And it, it seems like he's almost, so desperate for answers that he's going to believe anything right so how do you destroy the 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 person that stands in the way of your path to world dominance well you destroy him for within from within and from within his family so maybe that's a way that aurelius dumbledore is a lie is a fable right he's trying to destroy albus dumbledore from within by saying you know what you had this brother that you never knew about and presenting that conflict within albus Ooh, that's interesting i gotta i gotta i gotta think through that a little bit and it's gonna take me a while to do that but yeah stew on that one <laughs> i'll stew on that for a little bit so like i said credence search for identity is there is there any kind of other search that he might be on search for some cool clothes <laughs> I feel like he'd be into that. Maybe. New haircut. Maybe. Like, we all know that Credence shops at H&M. Come on. He does. He looks <laughs> good. Could you imagine Credence wearing some of the stuff that Ezra Miller that wears? Ezra wears. <laughs> oh, my I God. I love that. That would be crazy. Yeah. Maybe It'd that's... would be hilarious. Maybe those are the outfits what Credence wore. I mean, what Credence? Jesus. What what um, Ezra wore to the premieres. Maybe that's the stuff we're going to be seeing Credence in in the next fantastic beast films i hope so that so. would be some growth that i'm into <laughs> certainly plausible right yeah but anyway <laughs> back to this film yeah i mean it, the whole marketing campaign of the movie was around the search for credence's identity and he needs to know who he is and he's got to figure it out blah 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 and that was kind of the one uh, that i guess if we can take it at face value, was resolved by the end of the film. He found who he was, and now he knows at least who Grindelwald tells him he is. Um, so I am hoping that sets him up for, to be honest, a better plot in the third movie, because I was a little disappointed in just the search for Are You My Mommy? Um, so I think him having an idea of who he is will put him in more of a position of power and give him more momentum story-wise for mm -hmm. the third film. Yeah, I agree. I'm excited to see where Credence's character goes for the next, for the rest of the series, because, you know, he clearly had at the end of the film is trying to figure things out. Um, so I'm excited to see. Mm -hmm. more of credence in the future you know it's like it's like he seen okay so grindelwald's thinking is that credence is the only one that can destroy dumbledore right albus dumbledore um 
what I think is ultimately going to end up happening is that Dumbledore is going to be able to destroy the Blood Pact and then take Grindelwald out himself. But Credence is going to be a casualty, much like Ariana was a casualty there in their first uh, duel, their first in- major encounter there. So it could be, we all know J.K. Rowling likes parallels, and that, well, that could be a parallel of the first film, I mean, of the um, of the Ariana death as well. I mean, we all know that, you know, Cretans has an Obscurus inside of him. Ariana had an Obscurus inside of her. You know, that could possibly be the, you know, the big parallel moment in this series whenever we finally see the duel between Grindelwald and Dumbledore. It's fun stuff to think about. It's fun to theorize about. And I'm sure we're going to be doing much of it over the course of the next uh, good part of the year, I, I suppose, of 2019. Bailey and Luke are actually seeing the movie tonight for the first time. They that's why they haven't been on. They wanted to see it together. I yeah, just, I think they just wanted an excuse to not record. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They got a month off of the show. Mm-hmm. You know, we have people asking, "Where's Bailey and Luke?" Well, they're desperate for them. They're desperate. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but fun fact: Luke is actually going to the Wizarding World uh, theme park in Los Angeles for the first time. First time visiting any Wizarding World theme park. He's actually going tomorrow. So that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. If you're a Patreon, follow us over at, uh, or, you know, subscribe to us over on patreon.com slash Hogwarts radio. And, uh, they're going to be posting some fun things throughout the weekend. So anyway, let's go ahead and get to our next segment here. We have Avada Kedavra, Amortentia and Imperio. So I'm going to give the first three characters to Gretchers. Gretchers, you ready? I am ready. Okay. You have to say which one you would kill. It's Avada Kedavra. Which one you would give the love potion to? Amortentia, of course. And which one you would have them do your bidding, which is Imperio. So your three characters are Newt, Jacob, and Ron Weasley. Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, gosh. That's hard. Um, I think I would ask Jacob to do my bidding because I'd have him bake me things. Oh, good choice. Mm-hmm. I would... Oh, gosh, well, I would kill Newt. I'm sorry, Newt. I don't think I could <laughs> personally. <laughs> I love Newt. I love him. I don't think personally I could handle him every day. Um, So I would kill him and then I would marry Ron because I think Ron is a lot closer to what, what I'm looking for in a potential marriage here. Wow. Okay. So you would totally <laughs> kill Newt, yeah. this brilliant wizard, this brilliant, compassionate <laughs> don't wizard. Don't make me feel guilty about my choice. I, you know what? I am because Ron sucks. I don't like Ron. Ron does not suck. <laughs> I disagree. And honestly, when Love I started Ron. talking, that's not where I thought I was going with those. So that was a surprise <laughs> to me as well. <laughs> We're just full of surprises here on the show today. <laughs> All right, Sydney, are you ready? I am ready. You are getting three villains. Be prepared. <laughs> Your choices are Grindelwald, Voldemort, okay. or Ludo Bagman. <laughs> A big villain. Oh, hmm. I think I'm gonna. Hmm. I think I'm gonna Imperium Voldemort. Mm. I'm Ooh. going to Amortensia. Oh God, what a choice between Ludo Bagman <laughs> and Grindelwald. <laughs> um, we're gonna uh, Amortensia Ludo Bagman. I don't really have a good reason for that, but you know what? Sure. It's fine. We can, it's, it's fine. Let's give Ludo a save. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> gotta kill Grindelwald. You gotta kill Grindelwald. Aww. The process of elimination, Ludo is yours. <laughs> that is crazy. Okay, so out of the two villains, which one's your favorite, Sydney? Voldemort What's... or Grindelwald? Mm, I am excited to see where Grindelwald goes because I enjoy like the political aspects of Grindelwald. That's so for true. Me, I, Grindelwald's my favorite villain. Yeah, the two of them. Yeah. All right, Terrence, I got a fun one for you too. Oh God. Uh, so we got we got Grimson. We got Crawl. The the guy that he uh, couldn't make up his mind at the end and didn't really like him very much. And we got Tom Riddle, so pre-Voldemort. All right, so I'm going to kill Crawl. I'm going to in. Uh, is that how you say his name, right? Crawl? Crawl? Crow? Something like Crawl? that, yeah. Okay. I'm going to Imperio, the first guy. What, what was his name? Grimson. Grimson. Uh, to have him do my bidding. And I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to amortentia Tom Riddle. I think I would do the same, uh, honestly. Well, he's already been through it once. Why not the second time? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, there you go. Logic. <laughs> that, that, yeah, exactly. My logic is non flawable. <laughs> Unflaw. Unflawable. Non flawed. Unable to be flawed. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we've had a lot of fun on the show today. We want to thank everybody so much for joining us. And we invite you to follow us on our social networks, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those big ones there. And also to subscribe to our podcast, wherever you decide to get your podcast from. It could be the iTunes store, it could be Google Podcast or Radio Public or iHeartRadio, wherever you find Hogwarts Radio. Make sure you subscribe. Give us a rating. You'll never miss an update from the podcast at all. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. And thank you, Sydney, for coming back on the show. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. I enjoy it. We're going to have to do this again. And, yeah, go follow Sydney over on all of our social, all of her social outlets and follow us on all of ours. Why not while you're at it? Just hit that follow button. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Once again, I am Terrence Pinkston. And I'm Gretchen Rush. And that's it for episode 224. We'll be back, all of us, Terrence Bailey, Luke, and Gretchen, for episode 225. Bye-bye. That was bloody brilliant. Codswallop.